Hi, I'm Jamie. Welcome to Big House Voices. Today we have Jerry and Eugene. Where are you located right now? My name is Jerry Oldman and I'm located in uh, Brandon, Manitoba. But I'm originally from a small community in BC called Chalat, which means by the lake in our language. My name is Eugene and I'm currently located in unceded Coast Salish territory in uh, Musqueam, Squamish and Tsleil-Waututh. And I'm originally from a tiny community in the Northwest Territories in Denende in Treaty 11 called Treaty Duck. Can you talk a little bit about the podcast? You know, I heard my first podcast, I don't know how many years ago, and my, my wife actually said, you should listen to this podcast because I was talking about ideas and because I'm constantly trying to come up with ideas how to help people you know, find the light and do stuff like that. <laughs> anyway, so I listened to this podcast and it was a woman in New York City. She worked on Broadway directing plays, you know, and people go and do Shakespeare, or Macbeth, and stuff like that, and you can go watch them. So she volunteered to go to a prison in New York City to work with prisoners, and they're going to do Macbeth. So she directed them. So you have prisoners being actors. And she was talking about how much it changed these prisoners, because the one that was playing somebody that killed somebody actually killed somebody, you know, in real life. So there they were acting out their lives literally on this play. And she's talking about how powerful it was and how it changed people. And it changed me listening to it. So I said to myself, well, one day maybe I'll do a podcast. You know, so, um, so I sort of broadcasted it around and said, you know, I'm, I'm thinking of doing podcasts. And um, there were people, I was working in Vancouver Coastal Health in East Hastings. And um, they contacted me, said, hey, you interested in doing podcasts? Still? I said, yes. And they said, well, let's do one on men's wellness. So I said, okay. So that's how I got onto it. But before that, even I was saying that I want to go there because the youth are on the internet. And we need, I, and I could share stories with them, and inspire them, and then motivate them, and get them to feel good about being indigenous. That was part of my mission, and to heal, because heal means to become pure and original again. So that's how I got into the podcasting business, and now I have microphones and different things that I purchased, you know, to make podcasts. I'm still learning a lot you know, how to do it, even how to send a podcast to Eugene, he'll edit it. You know, one day maybe I'll learn how to edit, you know, so. But I just, I, it takes, um, takes me actually quite a while to develop a podcast. Like I just done one called Paradise. It's about making our house into paradise. You know, we can make our communities into paradise too. And it takes work and planning and stuff. So for me to plan that podcast and the messages I want to give out, you know, I rely a lot on culture and tradition because I don't have a university or college education. You know, I, I learned by being with the people. One of my bosses said, Jerry learned around the fire, <laughs> you know, listening to elders. And that's true. Part of that's true. I've listened to a lot of elders around the fire in the big house too. So you got a wonderful name for your show. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Eugene, what's your role in um, the podcast? Like Jerry, and um, some, on a similar note, I was self-taught as a graphic designer when I was younger. And I um, worked in the nonprofit sector. And I went home in 2013 for three years. And when I came back, I went to Langara. I took um, some courses in the Aboriginal Studies program there really enjoyed it and um, decided I was going to take a couple of years off and maybe start thinking about a different program. And in that time, um, I uh, facilitated some workshops at a youth gathering that was hosted by PHSA Indigenous Youth Wellness. And one of the managers sat in on my session and um, I guess she was interested in what I had to talk about. and. Shortly after, I was um, asked for a coffee and introduced to Jerry, 
and introduced to the idea of the podcast and they asked me to consult a little bit about it. So I came in for a meeting and um, we sat down and we kind of went over all the nuts and bolts about how, how we could produce a podcast. And, and then at the end of it, they, um, they offered me the opportunity to work with Jerry to produce a podcast. And um, I had just felt that at that point in my life, I had grown to a place where this was something I really wanted to focus on was indigenous men and boys and healing. And I, I, I describe it sometimes as this, is there are times in your life when you meet a person who, even though you can't put your finger on it, you can't quite describe it, you know that they've achieved some level, you can see some, in some way you can see that they've achieved some level of peace or healing. And those are the people that you listen to when they talk about healing. You, I, there's people out there who could talk about healing to their blue in the face, but when you recognize that someone has achieved it or done it, that's somebody you naturally will start to listen to, right? So that's how I thought when I met Jerry, I thought, I thought, wow, this person, you know, after all they've been through, they still are so generous. They have so much to give to the community. They have so much love for the community, um, for the people. And they've just been consistent for so long that this is someone I can absolutely, I hope to rub, I hope rubs off on me in any little tiny way. Um, so that, that became a no brainer for me. I was like, yes, I'll take a job and yes, I'll of course. Um, except the privilege of working with someone like Jerry. Do you think you can talk about um, Sacred Circles, Jerry? What does mm -hmm. that mean to you? Okay, to me, the Sacred Circle. Sacred means that something is um, special, ultra special, sacred. Something that we want to protect and take care of because it takes care of us. So the Sacred Circle. You know, and um, over the years, I've listened to people talk about circles, medicine wheels, you know, the planet Earth, the moon, you know, all of the things. They talk about how everything's in, the, in a circle. And the sacred circle, when we talk about human being, is our life. Because first off, we're, you know, when we're born, the first thing we do is learn how to breathe in our own because before that our mother was breathing for us. We were connected to the umbilical cord from the belly button to belly button. And our mother breathes for us. So we were part of our mother inside of our mother. She fed us, every, done everything for us. Then when we come out into the world, we're stepping onto the globe literally, and the globe is a circle. And the earth is a circle, it's round. So once you step on that, you're going to start moving in a circle. And if we treat that circle as sacred, we're going to be okay. As soon as the baby's born, they used to have ceremony for the baby, singing songs, you know, and uh, which is so beautiful to think of. You know, they had we had midwives, we had everything as indigenous people before contact with Europeans. And they maintained that circle. First off, by when the baby is born, like they do a song, then they have someone take the umbilical cord, like the afterbirth part of the whole process, and put it in a special container. Then they go put it in the water, or in the earth, or on a tree. And I asked my granny, my late grandmother, why did they do that? To connect the baby to the earth. Because the earth is now going to keep that baby alive before that the mother was keeping the baby alive. So they're putting us onto the circle, connecting us to the circle, that sacred circle. All life comes from the earth, oxygen, water, medicine, our clothing, everything come out of the earth. So they connect the baby to that circle, that sacred circle. Then we're going to start to move in a circle. You know, the first part is um, in the circle, of course, is being a baby. You know, then we start to learn to walk and to talk. Then we have puberty and we become men and women. And the part of that sacred circle, they'd have a ceremony for each step of the way. Like when we, when a baby first stands up, they have a ceremony and they mark the feet with um, red ochre make it out of crushed rocks or old stumps and it's the color red. 
and you mark the feet and the, from the knee down in special markings. So when that youngster starts to walk in the sacred circle, they'll be saved. So they'd mark, you know, that baby that stands up now. Then on that sacred circle and comes to puberty, because it's serious time, because now they can have children. So they take them and put them into isolation. And to really think, okay, what am I going to do with my life? To have a purpose. And um, so they take them and then they, some people call it a vision quest. We call it Kwasan Chut. That means we're training them for the next step in life, which is adulthood. So 13, 14 were adults already on that sacred circle. Then we move again. Then the next ceremony might be wedding. You know, and, you know before at one time, there was lots of arranged weddings in indigenous culture. Like I, 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 if that, if it was like that, I would have picked husbands for my daughters, you know, wives for my sons, <laughs> you know? and then it would have been simpler. You know, the, I was told that when there was arranged marriages, there was less separations. I couldn't believe that. How come? You know, like, you don't know that person. You didn't fall in love. <laughs> but it was arranged and it worked. It used to work. <laughs> so I believe in it. But I don't do it. I didn't tell my daughters who to marry. Sometimes I wished I did. <laughs> you know, so there's a wedding on the sacred circle. And then you just keep going around. And each step of the way, there's usually ceremonies and rituals that you do on the sacred circle. There's only so many ceremonies we go through as a human being for ourselves. There's birth, baptism. Like baptism, they'd mark the baby with um, red earth, you know, and different things. They have, everybody has their own way. Baptism is, is that part about connecting the baby to the earth. With the red ochre, when you use red ochre and you mark them after they're born, that's connecting the baby to the earth too. Plus protecting them from negative forces. Because they're on a circle now. And that circle, we want their circle to be big and it goes a long ways around. Before it used to be a hundred, wasn't, you know, it was, um, my great grandfather was 105 when he passed. And some of his, um, Nieces were saying, no, no, he's older than that, <laughs> you know, but that's because we were healthy because we're taking, because we're saying, okay, this is life, it's sacred. So we have to treat ourselves as sacred too, and each other. And the deer we kill, the moose, the fish, we have to treat that as sacred too. Because we're all together on this circle, the earth. And we're reminded of that when we look at somebody's eyes, their pupils are round. You know, our nostrils round. You know, the trees, when you look at the tree, the trunk is round. Blade of grass is round. The moon, everything we look at circle. So we really believe in cycles. That means going around in a circle. You cycle, you go around. And it's sacred because it's uh, beautiful. See, in a sense, it wasn't about a God because in our languages, we didn't know Jesus until where I'm from, maybe um, 1854, 1850. That's not that long ago, you know? So what did we know before that? We had our own words. Ours is a quilshin. It means what holds everything together. That there's something that just holds everything together. Just like for me, there's something that's holding my body together right now. It's my spirit. When that leaves my body, my body will go back to the earth. And I'll become really part of the circle then. Now I'm walking on the sacred circle. But I'll become part of the circle again.
my body will and then my spirit will go. So that's my understanding about the sacred circle, this light. You see, and then we walk in that circle. And just like they say, when you give away, and you're generous. Like, let's say you gave away a, a cedar root hat or a cedar bark hat. The elders would say, you don't worry about giving away that hat. Because it'll go in a, in a circle, it'll come back to you. Might be a big circle, could be a little circle, but it will come, that kindness will come back to you. So don't be afraid to give away, to be generous, because it'll come back. Because everything goes in a circle. We're human beings. If it then, you ever look up at the sky and see the stars and think, that's endless, there's eternity. That blew my mind when I first thought of it, laying outside looking, I say, there's no end to that. <laughs> I said, whoa, <laughs> got shaky for a while, you know. <laughs> so for us, we stay here, we go in the sacred circle. Otherwise, we just keep going, <laughs> you know. <laughs> so we're lucky in a sense, because we get to hear big house voices, we get to have good food, you know, I really have been wishing for herring eggs because I see herring eggs on, a, on the internet. And here I am in Manitoba, I can't have herring eggs. I'm going, oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what? Walking on the sacred circle, I've had it. As much as I wanted a piece. Oh, boom, 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 boom. Put some Wilgen grease in there. Doom, 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 doom. Some smoked salmon. Oh. It's paradise, <laughs> you know. <laughs> that's one of the. That's the beautiful thing about the sacred circle. If we treat it as sacred, we see a beauty in food, in people, in music, in the stars, in the tree, in the ocean. Can we treat it as sacred? That's what we see. And hear, and feel, and taste, and touch. Eugene, can you talk a little bit about uh, Sacred Circles, what we've been doing? Because um, you recently organized a Zoom meeting with all of us. To echo um, what Jerry says, I, when I think about the term Sacred Circle, I think about uh, an illustration in an essay that I saw from you. I think it was Thompson Highway, or it might have been Renee Highway. But I think it was Thompson Highway where he talked about the difference between indigenous, a lot of indigenous worldviews and more colonial worldviews, world where in, um, for example, Judeo-Christian um, theology, it's, it's kind of built in a pyramid where at the top you have God, and underneath God you have man, and underneath man is woman, and underneath men and women are children, and underneath children are animals, and underneath animals are plants, and this is the scale of the hierarchy of importance, right? So at the top, God is a divine. And you had kings and people like that who were, they said that they were, um, they were divine, they were ascribed divinity from God so they could, uh, they could say no to things that the Pope wanted, for example. But then Thompson Highway described us as having a pantheistic worldview, meaning man, woman, children, animals, plants, water, air, everything had the same there was no um, hierarchy, it was all, every, everything was equal in terms of importance. And I would, I would suggest that even further, one of the Dene teachings is that um, the earth doesn't need human beings to exist. Uh, human beings need the earth to exist. So um, I try to think about things like that in like a really circular kind of way of thinking. And then with the work that we do on our Sacred Circles project, Recently, I asked people to come up with a show and tell. So it was interesting because we had a group of uh, a group of people ranging from people of Jamie's age to some of the older people in the group were into their 60s and 70s who are all doing a show and tell. And we asked people to show one or two items or stories or teachings that are just kind of getting them through the, the quarantine that we're in. Because um, usually we would like to meet in person. And with Sacred Circles, we're talking about um, we're exploring how to facilitate healing for Indigenous families within the context of an Indigenous community. 
which is something that um, ironically hasn't been well funded or well researched. So when we think about the work that we do there, um, we are literally just trying to uncover the things that Jerry says and how, how to um, uh, actualize or how to make those things um, doable. Um, trying to think about concrete ways and actions that we can take to facilitate returning to that way of looking at uh, living, that way of um, walking on the sacred circle, as Jerry says. So I think that, yeah, that's, um, those are my reflections right now on sacred circles. Everything is a big circle. I definitely, I definitely subscribe to what Jerry said. You talk about a lot about um, community building through taking care of one another in uh, our communities um, on your podcast. How can we take care of each other during COVID and keep our community strong? It's a very good question. And um, here's how. That we sit down together in our houses, you know, because we're all in our houses now. And because um, I looked up the word isolate and it means to make into an island. So our houses are islands now. And we're all, look at it as a canoe. And the way canoe works, if everybody works together, it moves. It doesn't capsize, you know, it, it moves in the direction we want it to go. So my suggestion for families now is to sit around the table with a cup of tea or water or whatever and talk about what's acceptable in this household. Because when you do that, you're gonna, you're gonna you, someone will say, okay, this is not acceptable. Like you're not gonna holler at each other in this household. You know, if you do, we're gonna sit down, we're gonna talk about it. That's what we do in a canoe journey. Soon someone's upset and acting, I'll, I'll use the word negative. We stop and we have to, we sit down and we talk about it. What's going on, what's the matter? Then when that person has a chance to share what's bothering them, they, they put it out of their mind by talking about it. So in this COVID, if the families can sit down together and say, okay, this is how we're going to be. When dad cooks, I'm going to do the dishes. Then the younger brother says, yeah, okay, if she's doing the dishes, I'm going to sweep the floor. You know, so we all do something. Well, because we, we never be sitting still when somebody's doing something. Otherwise, it's, it feels unfair in the house. And you know how it is when it doesn't feel fair, you start to resent people start to say things, why doesn't she have to do anything? <laughs> you know, <laughs> I'll give you a story on that. I was, uh, when I was a young boy, me and my brothers, we have to go out and stack wood in the woodshed. My dad and I would split it, we're this young. And we have to um, stack the wood, pack it, move it, you know. And uh, So my brother and I are complaining because we had one sister. There's uh, six brothers and one sister. And my brother and I were complaining, how come Nancy doesn't have to do anything? <laughs> <You know? laughs> so we go in the house after we're done, it's getting dark, and we go in the house. And there's Nancy, she's just a little girl, standing on the chair with the apron tied around her neck and waist, and she's doing dishes. So we see that Nancy was actually doing something. And there we thought she was just sitting around in the house, right? <laughs> Being spoiled because she's the only girl. Oh, yeah, that's dad's princess. That's how we used to complain. <laughs> but my mother raised her really smart. She was a good cook, seamstress, businesswoman. You know, she, was, she could do it all. Drive her own truck, pick up her own. She ran the store in a grocery, you know, grocery store in a restaurant. She was, um, because we all work together. See, if so in the COVID, if we can do that. Because you could just imagine, like one of my favorite stories is when um, her, my mother was telling me when she's a little girl, 
they'd all go up in a mountain together, the whole community in the fall time to pick the berries to dry for the winter. And while the women and children are picking berries, the men would go out hunting. She say there'd be deer hanging in the trees. And they'd be taking the fat off them because they keep the fat too. Then they'd dry the deer meat while they're drying the berries. But when they do that, they'd go, someone would put out a great big hide on the middle of the camp. And everybody would put their food that they brought with them in that, on that hide. Then they would appoint two women to cook for the whole camp. And they would cook and they'd use the food that everybody brought. Plus they're eating fresh deer meat and stuff like that too. But they used to work together like that. And then when they're finished and go home, they divide it up. So each family got what they need for the winter. And that's what we need to do in our house again. Work together like that. So everybody's doing something. You know, and um, every once in a while have a sharing circle about how you're feeling. You know, because when we, it's called in the language, it's a yakwasit, it means free yourself. So when you have a chance to talk about something negative that's happening in your mind, you're freeing yourself, you're letting it go. And the trick is not to pick it up again. So they say, yakwasit kuyat. Free yourself and put it down. And don't pick it up again because you get you angry or afraid or depressed. You don't want to be either of those. We all get like that. I'm not saying it's not, not to be perfect, but we all get angry, we all get afraid, we all get depressed. But the thing is, is to get it out of our system and sharing circles will do that. Also in sharing circles, I suggest to families, you pick someone at each circle and everybody, has to say one good thing about that one person. Let's say it's a 10 year old boy in the circle. Oh, I seen him, he was helping mom with the cutting the vegetables. And somebody else will say, oh yeah, he never, he never says no. You know, things like that will start to come out. And it builds us up. We need that more than ever now. I need that. Last Friday I was, Walk, I come down and my wife sees me and I'm pouting. You know how people pout, their lip goes out, and, you know, and I was pouting. She says, what's the matter with you? Oh, I want to go to Starbucks. I want to go and I want to go down there and read the newspaper and say hello to people and they come in and I want to go to the bookstore and wander around the bookstore because I love to read. I want to be with people, you know, so I was pouting. So I had a chance to talk about it. So I got over it. Then I start to work again. <laughs> but I know it's not easy this time, you know, because I'm lucky in a way that there's just my wife and I in a building. And because um, we used to live in an apartment building and I know that can be dangerous now. So I really would suggest to people that they find ways to sit in a circle. They say once or twice a day, start the day, end the day, we're going to sit in a circle. You know, and um, have a little bit of sharing or play a board game or do something together. You know, because that ties us together. And I feel that's needed now, you know, that we tie ourselves together. Because it's a storm. It's called coronavirus. It's looking for us. But we're not going to let it get us by working together. Because it cannot, coronavirus can't move on its own. We have to go touch another person that's got it or where they coughed and they come out and landed on a, on a, on a solid surface and we go touch it and then we touch ourselves and it goes into us. It's literally sitting there waiting for us. We're not going to give it a chance by isolating and by being strong together. Because one of the big concerns now in quite a few communities is the partying that goes on because they can share the disease that way. You know, so that's why I say families need to say, okay, this is, this is acceptable. We all work together. 
it's not acceptable you walking out, not telling us where you're going. That's not acceptable. You know, because if they're going to go to town, let's say they live near town and they go to town, they can bring back the disease. We need to make that not acceptable. I know this is it's harsh. It sounds harsh, but it's to protect our children and elders and each other. You know, so that's what I suggest is that people sit down together to plan their whole day, what they're going to do together, what they're going to do as individuals. Because we can't be doing it all together all day long, you know. <laughs> but certain things we do things together. Then other things, like if you're going to read or play a game or something, you can do that by yourself. That's okay, you know. But there's, but I think we need to work together extra strong at this time, and then it'll become a way of life because that's where we come from. It's how our people used to live, work together. How are you staying healthy, um, mind, body, and soul during self-isolation for both of you? <laughs> yes, it's, um, I'm so glad I found out about this. Because the word health, being healthy, means to have a strong mind, body, and spirit. You know, and the mind, this incredible computer, it's not as good as my cell phone my cell phone knows more than i do <laughs> you know but it's pretty darn good but to keep my mind strong and clear you know i need to listen to positive people like you talk with positive people like you you know and olivia and um, eugene and other people i need to keep my mind strong because that's our attitude and attitude means we act and think or we act, talk the way we're thinking. So we're, if we're thinking negative, we're going to talk negative. And we're going to act negative. So to be positive, I need to work on that every day. And I have been now for many years. I said, I'm going to be positive. You know, because I, you know, I used to be angry bird. I used to criticize people and stuff like that, you know. And, be a complainer and a whiner sometimes, you know. But that's that's being in a sense being negative. So I take care of my mind by reading positive books, talking to positive people. I watch YouTube videos, you know, of um, elders from other nations talking. You know, I listen to positive music. I love traditional music, you know, hand drum music, you know, because it's all about lifting people up. It's about strengthening people. You know, some of the, the music I used to listen to when I was young, like you, you know, you look really young. You know, I used to listen to, my dad used to listen to country and western. And it's crybaby music. You know, like Hank Williams used to be good at playing crybaby music, you know. And, uh, you know, they, 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 that's, how, that's, that's what people started to get addicted to. They listen to sad music and they'd cry, you know. And there's, I remember there's a song even called "Tears in Your Beer," you know. And I used to listen to that, you know, and I'd be crying too. And that can become an addiction. Meanwhile, with a traditional music, you know, and it's about lifting people up, you know. Hey yo yo, hey yo yo yo, hey yo yo. Hey yo, hey yo, hey yo yo, hey yo yo yo, 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 yo. See that that song's lifted me up many times. There's a, that's how I keep my mind. Like when I start to feel down, if I really start to feel down, usually I'll pick up a drum and I'll start singing some songs. And it sort of relaxes me and I start breathing again. Because when our mind panics, it affects our breathing too. Either hyperventilates like, <sighs> or we breathe really shallow like we're trying to hide. Then our mind even gets more panickier. So we learn how to, I learned how to breathe to control my thinking. You know, to do deep breathing. 
like it's what people call meditation kind of stuff, you know, and start to do those kinds of things. Eh? I write, you know, positive messages that I want to give to people. I'll think about something. I'll say, okay, how can I say that? To keep positive, to always look for solutions rather than just be complaining about people. I look for solutions. So that's with my mind, with my body. Like this morning, I'm doing my, my exercises, my squats, and my lunges, and my crunches. And I, and I do a kata. You know, I took karate for I don't know how many years. And so I do the san chin kata. You know, and that's the first kata for the style I took. You know, it's, it's all about how to focus and breathe and how to strike and how to move. So I'll do that. In order to take care of my body. Then be careful what I eat. I was complaining to my wife because she shops. I used to go shopping. I, I don't mind, you know, I go out and go to Safeway or Sobeys with a cart, you know, and always once in a while a bag of chips would fall in the cart. <laughs> and my wife says, you, you will have too much salt already. No more chips. So, but every once in a while, she spoils me and gets a bag of chips. <laughs> you know, but we be, I'm careful what I put in my body. You know, I'll have coffee in the morning, but that's the only time I drink it is in the morning. Other than that, it's tea or a water. You know, got a water bottle here. Drink lots of water. You know, and exercise, go for a walk. You know, and um, keep myself clean, tidy. You know, braid my hair every morning, you know, and um, take care of myself. My body is sacred. Be careful what I put into it. Then my spirit. This, I think, is an important part. The other two are, I have to do that if I want to be healthy. But my spirit, because that's what holds my body together. If my spirit is strong. I have this incredible will to live. That means I'll take care of myself. I won't go out and where there's 10 people and stand with them because my spirit is strong. Because they know I can't go there. Because I have an incredible will to live. I want to live. I want to be here. Doesn't matter how cold it is, how many mosquitoes there are, anything, I still want to be here. You know, and then the other part of having a good spirit is I want to be successful at everything I do. So when I make podcasts, I'm really serious about it. There's a lot of stuff I don't even want to let out there because I don't think it's good enough. You know, I've deleted I don't know, more podcasts than I made, you know, and I shouldn't do that, you know, because there's some good parts in there, you know. But that's the way I am. I want to be successful. I want to be a successful husband, you know, a successful um, grandpa, grandfather, dad, uncle, cousin. Then the third part about having a good spirit is being kind. And I want to be kind all the time. Not be complaining or being negative towards other people. So that's what I do for my spirit. I work hard at having a good spirit. Being kind and generous and uh, being successful. Our people used to be successful. Hunters, fishermen, fisherwomen, you know. We were successful before, you know, and we still, we still are, we still can be you know, in our life. We need to be. Yeah. So that's what I've been doing for my mind, body, and spirit. It's something I've learned to do every day of my life. And, uh, I tell people I want to live to 100. My great-grandpa was 105. I want to shoot for 100. Not guaranteed I'll get there, but I'm going to work at it. <laughs> what about you, Eugene? How have you been keeping healthy? So for me, keeping healthy involves getting a good amount of sleep because when I was growing up, I really, I didn't think that it was that important, but now um, I really enjoy waking up early. Um, so I've been, I've been working at that, which means I have to make changes to how late I stay up because I also like, I've always identified as a night owl as well. So trying to make that balance work and I've been hitting it pretty recent, 
actually recently on a good stride where I wake up around 6.30 or 7. And that gives me enough time in the morning to not feel like I'm rushing. So I take my time, I wake up, I go into the kitchen over there and I make some coffee. And after my coffee, I'll sit, like for most mornings now, I'll sit down and in front of the mirror over there, I'll just put my phone there and I'll play some music that's kind of gentle and doesn't have any lyrics. And I close my eyes and I sit with my legs crossed and I just try to clear my mind. And it, I've got two songs that go back to back and it's about nine minutes, nine and a half minutes. So I'm like, this is my 10 minute sort of meditation where I try to just calm my mind and just start in a really, you know what I mean? Like a really calm start. And then I'll get up and I'll start my day. And at some point throughout the day, either by myself or with friends on Zoom, we do workout classes. And that's kind of really been helping with, with the mentals. Um, as if I, you know, if I get a good workout in, I feel like I've done something physical, it really helps. And then like Jerry said, is the diet. So I think at the beginning of the year to about the beginning of the quarantine, I was struggling with a little bit of depression as I do from time to time. And when I do struggle with depression, I find it harder to take care of myself. So I end up eating out more. You know, I'll eat lunch out or I'll just, you know, I'll get something on the way home from dinner or I'll order from DoorDash and I order takeout. And I just, I, I tend to feed myself like that because um, it's harder. But then as soon as the quarantine hit, it's like I snap back into, it, it forced me to kind of snap back into taking better care of myself. So then I, found myself, you know, I find myself at the grocery store once a week and take all the precautions. I wear a mask. I take, um, if I can, I wear gloves, bring my own bag and um, I stock up and now I'm cooking so much more than I have been in the last two years. I've cooked so much more than I have in the last two months. Um, and so it's been good because I like leftovers. I'm, I am a good cook. I like to cook. And um, it's actually challenged me to start making more salads, which is something I never really did growing up because I grew up in the Northwest Territories. So we didn't always have access to fresh produce. So now that I'm in Vancouver, you now I'm getting like, I'm getting creative, crushing up nacho chips with blueberries and cutting a little cutes of cheese. And that I feel is, um, is good. So diet, diet, sleep, exercise. And I'm also finding that it's really important to have a creative outlet. So whether that's, you know, that could be anything from beadwork, that could be um, drawing, that could be making movies, that could be making, uh, doing interviews like this. Um, but for me, I've been really focused on learning how to make electronic music. And now that I have that routine kind of dialed in, I find that I have a lot more time in the evening after work and um, after I eat because everything's kind of done for the day I tie it off and then I and then I can sit down and start getting creative and watching YouTube videos about um, music theory and learning how to play my keyboard over there and you know starting small with like the C major scale it's like ding, 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 and that kind of passes the time and then also on the weekend I find it's really important too to feel people miss feeling social but um there's been a lot of really interesting live streams that happen every weekend and that plus house party plus zoom means it's kind of still possible to hang out with your friends on Friday and Saturday night without having to go physically be together. And so that's been really, that's been really helping with um, some of the cabin fever. We're currently grieving a loss right now. Um, how do you grieve, especially during these times? You know, the word grieve means to carry heaviness. So we, we learn how to put it down no matter where we are. And as indigenous people, we had ways before. Like with myself, for instance. Like I got long hair now. And some people may ask me, why are you growing your hair? And I say, I'm growing my hair for my loved ones that they have a long life. So the last time I cut my hair was my mother passed away. And I was in, in Europe when she passed away. I was in a holiday. As soon as I hear, I cut off all my hair to let her go, to start that process of letting her go. So I cut off all my hair. And then um, we cut our fingernails and toenails. And then we, um, we get... Um, piece of buckskin or deer hide tanned. It's nice and soft like a shoelace. 
and we'll tie it around our wrists, our ankles, and our neck, where I'm from. And that's a symbol of, um, we don't know when your loved one's gonna pass away. So you don't take those off, you let them fall off on your own. Plus it lets everybody know you're grieving so they can treat you differently. You know, because sometimes we'll say things and we forget that they just lost their mom, for instance. And then we look at them and we can see they're down. You know, so that's to alert everybody that that person is grieving yet. You know, so I think we, we can still do those things, you know, as individuals. And also we can do like a Zoom little gathering. Because when, when like where I'm from, as soon as someone passes away, we light a fire outside the house. And it keeps going until the funeral is over. So everybody can go, when they want to, they can go stand around the fire and tell the stories and, you know, and, and share it with each other. So we can do that now, you know, on the um, internet. We can, someone can light a candle and say, we're going to have a little gathering, fireside gathering. And usually it's uh, to share stories about the goodness of that person that has left, you know, or to the elders that say, we're here to counsel you. That means to prob have solved problems when we go stand around the fire. You know, we can do that now virtually, you know, like with the candle, like I'm saying. Because the most important thing is what we say and what we hear and how we feel. So it's all about not stopping the grieving, but allowing it to happen. You know, so because when we stop it, that's when we get in trouble. So the whole thing is to let people to cry, because that's how you free yourself. Because when you swallow it, it becomes bitter in you, it can eat away at you, and you sort of lose your vitality. But as soon as people break that, that, um, that stress of trying to hide their feelings, you just let it out, you know, and you start to heal then. That's how come we need to still do it. Even if we're houses apart, we can still do it. We can, uh, just like what we're doing here, you know, like I talked about my mom, and I had a little bit of sadness in remembering her when I cut my hair. I, I wasn't at home, so I had to get my hair cut in a barber shop. And I said, I don't know where I can cut my hair. And my wife says, I'll Google the best barber shop in Surrey, you know, because we're going to go for, we'll go to Costco in Surrey and then go to the reserve. Because we flew back from Europe and landed in Vancouver. So she found this barber shop. So I go in there and it's East Indians. And there's a lineup, so I'm sitting there. And my turn comes and this man calls me over. And I had long hair. Said, what can I do for you, sir? And I says, I want all my hair taken off. All of it? Yes. He's looking at me. What do you mean all of it? I said, you know, Re that's short, number one, even shorter if you have the thing. Looks at me, can I ask why you're doing this, sir? Your hair looks so nice. I said, well, you're gonna help me. He says, how? Oh. I said, my mother went to the spirit world and it's our way to cut off our hair, to let her, to help me let her go. So he gets the scissors out and he cuts then he gets uh, clippers out. And he's saying, I'm so glad I can help you, sir. He says, do you want to take that hair? I said, yes, because I'll put it in the fire because I'm part of my mother and I want to let that go. I want her to go in peace to the spirit world. So he cuts my hair and look how much it's grown. You know, so I'm growing it again for my loved ones now. But when I grieve, I cut my hair. Elders tell me, you don't have to get that drastic, even if you cut four or five inches. 
is still a sign of letting go. And your fingernails and toenails, because it's, it's the end of your body. It's our hair and our fingernails and toenails. So you cut that off to symbolize that you're letting go the one that's left us. So I think we can revive, I know we can revive those things if it's part of your culture. If not, you know, find out what it is, you know, and do it individually. And, and as a group, you know, have little sharing circles about your feelings and about the person that left. Sometimes it's, I know it's hard because some of those people made some terrible mistakes, but still someone's missing them. And we must give them that chance to free themselves, let those feelings go. So that's my thoughts around that.